Welcome everyone. We are so glad to have you. Today's program is part of the Presidential Primary Sources Project. And our program today is Lincoln's Evolving Legacy in Washington, DC, Places as Primary Sources. And we have the incredible teams from Ford's Theater and the National Mall and Memorial Parks today to present to you. The Presidential Primary Sources Project is a series we put on every year. It starts in January and goes through um, the beginning of April, every Tuesday and Thursday. And all of our programs are a partnership between Internet2, the National Archives and the National Park Service. Just a quick reminder today, by participating, you are agreeing to be recorded, streamed and broadcast. So we are recording all of our programs. They live on our YouTube channel so that students and teachers can access them um, even if they can't make it live. All right, we're so excited to have you participate today. It's a lot more fun if everybody participates. So we're just gonna go over a few expectations. Um, if you're participating via video, you can kind of just raise your hand um, and we will call on you. Uh, if you're having students speak, um, try to have them come towards the front so we can hear you. If you're not on video, but you would like to be, please just put some information in the chat and I will promote you to a panelist. That's how we can see your video. If you are participating just with your voice, but you don't want to be on video, there's a little raise hand icon. It looks a little red hand. Um, you can use that and we'll help you unmute. And then of course there's the chat. So if you haven't found the chat already, it looks like a little caption bubble, go ahead and click on that. We will use that a lot today um, and anyone can participate with that. Again, we want you to participate as much as possible. That said, uh, please be respectful of these interactive tools. We really wanna stay focused on answering the questions and asking questions related directly to what our presenters are talking about. All right, and with that, I just wanted to say one more thanks. We're so excited to have you here. This is our website if you want to find out more information about our future programs or access our recordings. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to the people you came to see. Awesome, thank you. I will share my screen. All right, how's that? Give me a thumbs up. You can see our PowerPoint. Excellent. Fabulous. All right. Well, my name is Alex Wood. I work at Ford's Theater here in Washington, D.C., and I'm here with my awesome co-host, Ranger Jen. Hi, everybody. I'm Ranger Jen from the National Mall. Very excited to be here with you all today. And we are going to be talking about sort of how we remember President Lincoln through places, particularly here in Washington, D.C., um, but yeah, how we sort of use places, whether they're buildings or street names or squares or historic sites, um, how we think about people and history through place. Okay, so first up, we're going to be talking about President Lincoln. So what comes to your mind when you think of President Lincoln? What are the first things that come to mind? What do you remember about him? Why do we study him in school? Go ahead, Edgewood. Uh, the Civil War. Yeah, Civil War. Our friends at um, Spurline say his beard, right? Excellent. We've got all bearded pictures here. <laughs> what else? What other things do we remember President Lincoln for? Another friend at Edgewood? Uh, it is that he's the tallest president. That he was a super tall president. Excellent. Go ahead, Edgewood. How he helped abolish slavery. Yeah, spot on. He helped abolish slavery. Spurline in the chat put in that he was assassinated. Yeah, exactly. Back to Edgewood. Um, I think of the $5 bill. Yeah, because he's on the $5 bill. Awesome. Okay, I think I see a hand in four corners. Go ahead, four corners. 
He was also known for wrestling. He was. <laughs> That's great. He's actually in the Wrestling Hall of Fame, which is pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Oh, yeah. And we've got um, Stephen Gilroy in the chat says the Gettysburg Address. So he was known for his speeches. He's known for the Civil War. He's known for helping to end slavery. He's known for his beard and his hat and his height. All these different things. Um, awesome. Great responses, everyone. What are some places you think about when you think of President Lincoln? Maybe you've got a Lincoln street or a Lincoln school. What are some places you think about? Edgewood. Well, uh, Lincoln Memorial. Yeah, the Lincoln Memorial, excellent. Four Corners. Oh, the Battle of Gettysburg, Gettysburg. Yeah, Gettysburg Battlefield, awesome. And in the chat, we've got uh, from Spurline, we've got Kentucky. From Gilroy, we've got his log cabin, his birthplace. Awesome. Excellent. Edgewood again. We have the um, White House. Like, uh, I looked, and, like, there is um, a part of the White House. Yeah, yeah, the White House, the President's House. Excellent. He's on the penny. So we sort of carry him with us a lot of places, right? <laughs> Excellent. All right. Uh, one more from Edgewood. I used to go to a school named Abraham Lincoln Elementary. Fabulous. Lincoln Elementary School. And there's Lincoln Elementary Schools and high schools all over the country, right? Very cool. Okay, so we're gonna be focusing on some places here in Washington, DC. And have any of you visited Washington? Raise your hand. No, just a couple? Okay, excellent. So for those of you who have not been to Washington, DC, this is, this is us, this is our map. We're this sort of half diamond shape and then downtown I've circled here in purple. Uh, we're over on the east, East Coast in the Mid-Atlantic, we're surrounded by Virginia and Maryland, and we're going to zoom right into downtown Washington. So here's our neck of the woods specifically. So the Lincoln Memorial, I've got the big star over here. It's right on the west end of the National Mall, which is this big green park space. It's not where you go shopping. It's where you get to go walking and exploring, and that's where all the Smithsonian museums are. And then just up the street from the National Mall is Ford's Theater. So we're gonna be focusing on these two places today. Oh, awesome. We've got friends in Bowie, Maryland. You guys are our neighbors. Okay, the Lincoln Memorial and Ford's Theater. Some of you named the Lincoln Memorial when you were thinking about places. And then some of you named the fact that he was assassinated when we were thinking about Lincoln himself. So these are two places that um, explore some pretty important parts of President Lincoln's story. And what's really special about these two places is one was created to remember President Lincoln. It was built because people got together and decided they wanted to remember this person. And the other place became important because of what happened there. So Ford's Theater became an important historic site because it is where President Lincoln was assassinated on April 14th, 1865. So let's start with Ford's Theater. Here we are. I love this picture. I love sharing this picture because it's such fun to be standing on stage at Ford's Theater. So on stage at Ford's Theater, if you were to visit us today, this is what you would see. So um, if you were President Lincoln, where do you think you would sit? You type your answers in the chat. I see hands up. Hands up in four corners. Go ahead, Where four corners. I'm sorry, go ahead, honey. Uh, you see that booth up there? That's where he would sit. 
All right, be more specific with up there. What's what's giving you a clue? Uh, that it looks like the most important spot because it's like a booth. Yeah, so it's a VIP box and it's decorated with flags to make it look extra presidential. So spot on, yeah, Spurline saw it too. The boxes on the sides, those are the VIP seats. And then even more special than any VIP seat would be the presidential box here decorated just so. So we have the box decorated today, just as it was for President Lincoln back in 1865. And what's really cool about Ford's theater now is if you were to come to Ford's, you would get to go visit the museum. You could see the theater and you could see a play on stage. So Ford's Theater is a working theater today, just like it was back in the 1860s. And no matter what play is on stage, we always have President Lincoln's box on view. So now we're sitting in the audience looking at the stage so you can see the flags and we never cover those up no matter what's happening on stage. And so it's been a long time, right? 1865 was over 150 years ago and Ford's Theater hasn't been the same for all of those years. It's changed a lot over time. But if we go back to what it would have looked like for President Lincoln, this is a historic photograph from 1865 taken just days after the assassination. This is actually a crime scene photograph um, taken by Matthew Brady and his photographers in his studio. And so here again, the stage looks pretty different than what we were just looking at, right? Because we do plays today, so we do new work, but the theater itself looks pretty much the same. We've got President Lincoln's box just so, the big fancy boxes is on the other side. And so what Ford's Theater, we're this sort of combination of old and new, which is pretty special. So how did Ford's Theater come to be what it is today? When President Lincoln was assassinated at Ford's Theater on April 14, 1865, it made Ford's Theater an important historic place. This tremendous tragedy had happened there. And this is a photograph of um, Ford's Theater from the outside. So this is Ford's Theater right here. And if you look really closely, you can see that it's draped in black. Do you see these black um, ribbons hanging out the window? And there's people standing outside in front of it. So the city is mourning the loss of President Lincoln in this photograph. They're still sad after President Lincoln's death. And so the city is draped in black. And this, there's a question of what to do with the theater. So I want to put that question to you. We're going to use the poll feature. So President Lincoln has just been assassinated in Ford's Theater. It is the year 1865. What would you do with this place? Would you tear it down? Would you keep it as a theater? Would you turn it into an office building? Would you make it an educational institute devoted to Lincoln? So go ahead and throw in your votes. Awesome question in the chat. Does the view from the boxes make it hard to watch the show? Is it a good view or is it VIP because it's separate? So in Lincoln's day, being part of the show, was the was a good thing it's what people wanted to see so they were good seats in the 1860s today they're not so good seats because you would barely be able to see the show just as you observe you'd be like on stage with everybody and so today when vips come to ford's theater nobody sits in president lincoln's box people um sit in the front row of the orchestra so they get front and center seats just like if you were in a movie theater and you could see the whole thing good question all right, have we all voted? Five more seconds to get your votes in. And all right, we're gonna end the poll. Fabulous, okay, we'll share the results. So interesting, none of you wanted to tear it down. Half of you wanted to keep it as a theater. Nobody thought about turning it into an office building and about another half of you wanted to make it an educational institute devoted to Lincoln. Okay, awesome, great. So um, I asked you these four options because all four of these options were on the table in 1865. So there were people in 1865 who wanted to do each of these things. First, there were people who wanted to tear the place down. They didn't want it to be marked as this place of tragedy. They wanted it gone. They wanted to erase the horror of what happened. Some people even threatened to burn the building down. So they had to protect it with police 
Ford of Ford Theater wanted to keep it as a theater. It was his property, it was his business. He tried to open a show as soon as he was allowed to get back in the space after the crime scene investigation was completed. But those people who wanted to burn the building down got in his way, so he couldn't go on and continue with it as a theater. The YMCA, the same YMCA that we know today from the song that maybe you have danced to, wanted to make it an educational institute devoted to Lincoln. Um, they, didn't, they weren't able to raise enough money to buy the building though, so they weren't able to see that through right away. So who wanted to turn it into an office building? This guy, his name is Edwin Stanton. He was the Secretary of War and he served under Lincoln in Lincoln's cabinet. And he made this argument that this place that had become this place of tragedy could be a place where they could remember President Lincoln by caring for others who President Lincoln had cared for himself during his lifetime. And so he makes this argument that it cannot continue being a theater, that the public will not stand for it. The public feeling regarding that spot as hallowed, this is very sacred language, by the, uh, by the blood of their martyr president and considered it, that its desecration as a place of theatrical exhibition would be a national reproach and an outrage against humanity. So no theater right away in this place. But instead, it should be a building where they can process the pensions and requests of the soldiers and veterans who had also fought and died during the Civil War. So to honor President Lincoln by helping to take care of the soldiers who he cared so much about during his lifetime. And making this connection from Lincoln who sacrificed his life at the end of the war to all of the other um, soldiers who had also sacrificed so much during the war. So Edwin Stanton was persuasive and that's what he did. He turned the building of Ford's theater into an office building to process veterans pension requests and medical records to help take care of Union soldiers after the Civil War. And in this way, he turned this building into a memorial to Lincoln. So not so Something we would think of today, right? But even in 1865, they were trying to figure out how to remember President Lincoln by honoring his life, which is kind of cool. Okay, so it was this office building where they were processing veteran pension records. And it wasn't until the 1920s that they even put a plaque on the front of the building saying this is where President Lincoln was assassinated. So this plaque here wasn't even put on the building until 60 years after the assassination happened. That's kind of interesting, right? We think about people moving and living in Washington and they knew about this building, but there wasn't a sign saying what had happened in this place for 60 years, kind of cool. And then it wouldn't be until a hundred years after the fact that people really wanted to see the theater again. So this is kind of interesting, right? So in the 1960s, a hundred years after President Lincoln was assassinated, people were coming to this building, seeing the plaque, looking inside and saying, you know, we really want to see the theater. We want to see the stage. We want to see that special VIP box. And so the National Park Service who owned the building at the time and still does today, they said, okay, we'll restore the theater and we'll use those crime scene photographs and restore the theater. But then this question of how to remember President Lincoln in this place came up again. And as you can see from these newspaper clippings, there was this argument that it needed to be a place that remembered President Lincoln for something he loved during his life and not just a place to remember the tragedy of his death. So there's all, you know, there's this tension sort of ev in every generation about honoring President Lincoln for things that he cared about during his lifetime. I particularly am struck by this, this excerpt here down in the bottom corner. It would be a modern tragedy if all this money were expended to reenact his death in the theater while he himself had spent so many pleasurable hours of life there. So 
a theatrical organization, the Actors' Equity Union, and a woman named Frankie Hewitt got together and persuaded the National Park Service to restore the theater to be a working theater and to allow plays to continue on stage 100 years after the fact. And I really love this photograph because you can see the inside of the theater when it's being restored. And so that's what happened. In 1968, we had our next play on stage, 103 years after the assassination. Here's another one of those crime scene photographs of that presidential box. And here's what it looks like for us today. So look how carefully we've recreated all of these details. And then when you come to Ford's Theater, you get to learn about President Lincoln, understand the tragedy that happened in this place, but then celebrate President Lincoln and honor his life by doing something that he loved to do. So kind of cool that it comes full circle that we're honoring his life in this place that was the place of his death. Kind of, kind of um, a cool tension there. And just as I said, we never cover up that box. So here we have a cast on stage and a whole bunch of people in the audience, musicians here in the orchestra pit, and there's President Lincoln's box. All right, so that's a place that had history happen in it and was made to be a place that we remember President Lincoln. But I'm gonna to toss it over to Ranger Jen. And uh, this is Ford's from the outside. And we're gonna talk about a place that was made to remember President Lincoln. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, this is a really pretty shot. Um, I know some of you said you've been to Washington. I hope when you do come to visit someday, you all have the chance to, to tour around the National Mall in the evening, because when all the memorials are lit up at night, it's a really uh, spectacular view. Um, so yeah, a place built to remember President Lincoln. And what's interesting about this place, just as we saw at Ford's Theater, how it's changed over time, we're gonna see the theater changed physically over time. We're gonna see how the meaning of this structure sort of changes over time. So we go back to the beginning of constructing this building. Um, this takes place between 1914 and 1922. So it's a good bit of time after Lincoln's death. And people had talked about uh, memorials for President Lincoln. There were some other memorials, even in Washington, there's some other memorials for President Lincoln that get built before this one. But this involves a Lincoln Memorial Commission, a, a, a formal group that's going to figure out where to build it. There was debate. Some people didn't like this particular location. Um, and then there would um, you know, be the whole design because all of our memorials go through this whole process of getting approved and designs approved and artists approved and all of that. So um, I don't know if anyone was listening to when I said this was finished, um, but it was 1922. And so I'm wondering if I have any really uh, quick math whizzes in the group here who recognize how old the Lincoln Memorial will turn this year. Oh, that was fast. Edgewood, go ahead. There. 100? Exactly. Yes. The Lincoln Memorial turns 100 this year. And so this is a big deal for us. We're very excited about this. Miss Alex is tired of hearing me talk about it, I'm sure. Um, but we are, you know, looking for ways that we can, you know, get people excited about the Lincoln Memorial and its history and um, celebrate it at the same time. And so the, the memorial was dedicated in May, and we hope that May is going to be a month full of, of um, engaging things to do when you, uh, <laughs> when you come to visit us, hopefully sometime soon. So if you all have thoughts, I've asked every group I talk to, um, what kind of ideas, what, what do you think we should be doing to celebrate 100 years of the Lincoln Memorial? Keep that, uh, oh, oh, hang on a sec, hang on. Let's, I'll get your ideas before we go, hold on. Um, but, uh, and if we don't get them today, you make sure you email me because I do, I wanna hear ideas that you all have. But um, I wanna tell you a little bit about this building and see um, when you hear the story, if it maybe sparks any other ideas for you. So this is a great shot because you get to see how it was built, how it was all put together. You can see the pieces of the columns down front that haven't been added to the, to the, to the columns uh, around the building. And you can see how deep the foundation goes, which is really interesting because this shows that um, you know, the ground that this was built on at one, at one time was part of the Potomac River, which is right behind it. And um, so it has to be really solid. You're building this very heavy building 
in this ground, you want it to have a solid um, you know, foundation. You might also notice if you've got your uh, sharp eyes on here today that you can see another monument in the distance. Anybody see another monument in the distance? Oh God, they are quick over there, aren't they? Well, it looks like we have a we have a hand at four corners too. Four corners. After there you go. Yeah, the Washington Monument's off in the background there too. Finally finished after years of of slow construction process there. Um, so not only uh, do we see the the neat photos of this building being built, but also the statue itself of President Lincoln, which hopefully you've seen before. Um, it's uh, a seated Lincoln in a chair there, and it's inside this big fancy building. So the one guy was responsible for the building and one guy was responsible for the statue. Daniel Chester French did the statue and he would, um, work on most of his model from his studio in Massachusetts. And I'm sure he knew the dimensions of the building, but when it came to putting the model of the statue into the building, he saw that it looked really small. And so he decided to double the size of the statue. And when he did that, he had a hard time finding a big enough piece of rock. And so it ends up that the Lincoln statue is made of 28 different pieces of marble all put together like a big puzzle. And um, you see the picture on the left, which I think is my favorite picture ever, of the um, guys putting this statue together. And I've been, uh, been learning a little bit more about these guys. These are some famous stone carvers from New York City. Actually, they were a family all born in Italy who came in the late 1880s to be um, stone carvers in New York City. So it's, uh, it's one family with a father and then six brothers who all became stone carvers. It's pretty exciting. So I do not see the difference in the rock. I think they did a really good job of where they put all the pieces together. And it's really hard to tell where the different pieces end, start and end. Um, and the picture on the right, I guess they're putting the finishing touches on it. They're scoping it out. Um, that's a little hard to look at because you know nobody goes climbing on the Lincoln statue. As park rangers, it's a very important part of our job that we preserve and protect these places so that when you come to visit, it's in very good shape. So um, it almost hurts me a little bit to see somebody standing up there, but I guess he's allowed if he's finishing the work there. Um, you know, the Lincoln, I think, um, did suffer a little bit of damage, but not nearly the damage that the Washington Monument. It was much more um, prevalent in the news that you heard about the Washington Monument, probably because it affected the elevator. Um, but there has been restoration work done since the earthquake on the, the roof at the Lincoln Memorial. So that might be um, attributed to the earthquake. That was just such a weird thing that happened to us all that day. Um, so yeah, here's the 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 you know inside of the Lincoln. Here it is all finished. See that chain? That keeps you off from getting too close. Um, so <laughs> makes me feel a little bit better now. But I want to tell you that when they were building this building, they were very focused on an idea about President Lincoln. They wanted to remind us that it was President Lincoln who held this country together. Now, granted, there was this terrible civil war, but he fought hard to make sure the country could get back together. And so they were very focused in building this memorial on the ideas of unity and reunion. And you see that even in the words just above his head in this temple as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the union, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. So for whom he saved the union, that's what they wanted to focus on in this building. And so throughout it, inside and out, we see lots of symbols that remind us about the unity of the country. And uh, one of my favorites to share is, is tucked away in this photo right here. Um, a symbol that you all probably see every day at school. Maybe you see it out um, at sporting events. It's a symbol of our country that you would see all over. Patriotic symbol representing our country. Anybody want to throw it in the chat box? Mm, I see a hand at four corners. Four corners, go ahead. Great. Um, the American flag. Yeah. Excellent. Can you find the American flag, any of you? in this picture of President Lincoln. You have to be a little creative about it. Probably not exactly the way you're used to seeing the American flag. Anybody have a guess? Go ahead, Four Corners. Yeah, I think it's struck across the arms on the chair. 
Awesome. Yes. It is that piece of cloth that you see draped behind mm -hmm. his chair. That is meant to be the American flag. And obviously you're not going to be able to get too close to it, but if you could stand on the sides there and look at it, how would you know that it's the American flag? What would give it away? What would you see? Stars You got it. Exactly right. The stars and the stripes. It's hard to see, but the next time you come to visit, you check it out and see if you can, uh, you can find those stars and stripes on that, on that piece. So here's another way of um, reinforcing this idea of how important the unity of the country was. You put a symbol like the American flag that everybody would recognize, although I don't know a lot of people recognize it there, um, but this idea of, of the unity of the country, very important when they're designing it. And uh, you know, here we are talking about primary sources and we're looking at places, but of course the words are important as well. And here's one of um, President Lincoln's most famous speeches, the Gettysburg Address carved on the wall. As you walk up the stairs, it's to your left. Um, memorable speech that he gave at the, the cemetery at the after the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, if you were to go up to the right, you would see another famous speech, the um, his second inaugural address. This was March of, of 1865, just weeks um, weeks before his um, his assassination. Gosh, I have a question about hearing the Gettysburg Address on your phone. You know, I'm not actually sure. We did at one point have like a a cell tour. I'm not sure if that still exists or not. I'll have to get back to you on that. I'm not quite sure. Um, but yeah, here, uh, here we go again. There's, um, there's that phrase, the, the save the union part of this um, very important uh, theme that's, that's throughout this memorial. Um, we see this uh, statue uh, the, this up close above the statue of President Lincoln. And I think we also have some artwork. And this is really interesting because we focus so much about unity and yet we have a mural. These two murals are above the speeches. So on either side um, of the, the walls there, you have the speeches and then above them, you have it over, um, you have these murals which were painted up on the walls that represent um, unity, of course, and emancipation, which is not an idea you're going to hear me mention a lot of today when I'm talking about what the builders of this memorial intended. They didn't, um, they didn't want to talk a lot about this here. So it's interesting that this mural appears up on the wall. And you know what, I bet there are a lot of people who come and never even notice those murals because you have to look up high above the, the speeches. And um, so it's really neat. When I first got to the mall, and I've been there a long time, they were just um, touching these up, like kind of uh, restoring the, the painting. These are oil on canvas. And so um, it's neat to see them up close because we don't often get to see them like this. So on the outside, we also have a lot of symbols of the union. You see the names of the states on the, on the roof above the, the, uh, the columns there. So we have two rows of states, the row, the, row, the bottom row, are the 36 states in the country at the time that Lincoln was president. There were 36 states, and for each one of those states is a column. So the 36 columns around the outside of the building are reminding us of the states in the Union. And the top row, which you can see in the top right corner, are, um, oh yeah, on the bottom too, I guess. <laughs> You've got, uh, you've got the 48 states in the country at the time that the building was finished in 1922. And since that time, of course, we've added two states, Alaska and Hawaii, and we didn't have any more room on the top of the roof to add those two states. So um, there's a plaque down front. I don't know if you can actually point it out in that bottom picture, or maybe the bottom left one. Um, but just as you start to approach the steps um, down near the road, sort of, yeah, I think that could be it right there, um, is the plaque for Alaska and Hawaii. So we, we wanted to make sure all the states are represented because Unity was such an important theme to uh, to President Lincoln. I can't tell on that last picture. Can you see the bridge behind? Yeah, you see the edge of the bridge. I'm looking at it right there. Um, one other literal connection is the fact that Washington sits right on the edge of the Potomac River and you cross that river and now you're in Virginia. And Virginia, of course, was part of the Confederacy. So in the 1930s, they built a bridge that connects Washington to um, to Virginia, so it's literally connecting, um, reuniting North and South right there um, behind the Lincoln Memorial. So 
lots of symbols of unity, just that painting to deal with uh, the idea of, of emancipation, which was such a, a, a critical part of Lincoln's legacy. So May 1922, the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial, the folks in charge of this event are going to really hit hard on the idea of unity and reunion and the country being reunited again. Here's the, the crowd that has come out for the dedication. They've come to see and hear some, uh, some big name people. And um, of course, see this building finished and opened for the, for the first time. Our main, uh, our main characters at this event would be, are they in there? Yeah, these guys, handsome bunch. Far left, William Howard Taft. He's the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And he's the um, head of the Lincoln Memorial Commission. And he's going to turn this memorial over to the guy in the center. That's Warren Harding, the President of the United States. So the people that most, the person most people wanted to see that day though, is this guy on the right. That's Robert Todd Lincoln. He's the only surviving son of President Lincoln. Can you imagine going to a dedication of a memorial for your father? Um, this must have been a really big deal for him to be in attendance as everyone is coming to celebrate his father's legacy with um, this at this big memorial. So in this picture in 1922, Robert Lincoln was in his late 70s. He would live a few more years, died in his early 80s. So that would put it in, still in the 1920s, I think. So no, he is not still alive today. And these guys are going to speak, not Robert Lincoln. He didn't speak. He just wanted to be there and check it all out. Um, but these other two men are going to speak, and they're going to focus very much their remarks on this idea of reunion and how the country has survived and come back together. And what makes this uh, sort, of, sort of interesting is that while we are celebrating Lincoln and his legacy at this memorial, the audience at this dedication ceremony was segregated because in 1922, Washington DC was still a very segregated city. Blacks and whites did not mix. You may be looking at this picture and wondering, wait a minute, it sure looks like in this picture, we see some, um, some um, African-American folks and white folks sitting together. Um, these are Civil War veterans and they allowed all the Civil War veterans to sit together in this section. So this is a really unique photo of, of the space that was allowed for the veterans. But there are some in incredible articles, newspaper articles of the time, which looked on this event as not even being a real dedication because of the fact that people had to sit in separate sections. One um, African-American newspaper described it as being open but not dedicated because it was, shouldn't be dedicated if people weren't free to sit in the crowd where they wanted to sit. Doesn't represent what this memorial should represent and, and having a segregated audience just didn't seem um, appropriate. There was, however, a keynote speaker, Dr. Robert Moten, an African-American. He was the president of Tuskegee Institute down in Alabama. He followed um, Booker T. Washington in that role. And he was invited by Taft to come and speak, but, while Moten wanted to really use this as an opportunity to say, you know, look, here we are honoring President Lincoln. We should remember what he did and how he helped to end slavery. And this would be a great opportunity for us to think about promoting civil rights at this time. Um, he had to send Taft his draft speech and Taft asked him to cut some of the words out because there was too much, too many words is what he said. But what he really meant was, we don't want you talking about civil rights here. That's not what the theme of this event is all about. And we want to focus more on unity and, and this idea of reunion. And so he had to cut some words out. And it's really interesting. You can read, um, since we're talking about primary sources, you can read what Moton's draft speech said, and then you can read what Moton actually said at the dedication, which is a little bit different. And so really fascinating if you want to uh, look into that. Um, we have some great links on our webpage at the National Mall. Uh, related to the Lincoln Memorial and some activities you could do if you wanted to look at this a little bit more. Um, so yeah, Dr. Moten gets to stand up there. It's a really um, important part of this event, but he doesn't exactly get to say all that he wanted to say um, when he had the opportunity. But you know, when you're offered the chance, you take it because you don't know when you're going to get a chance like this to speak to this many people again. And so that's why he was he was there. So over the years, 
we have seen what they built this place for. They, you've heard me say it now a thousand times, right? All about unity and reunion. But we see that maybe that's not what people coming to the Lincoln Memorial are thinking about today. And we see how this has sort of changed what, it's, what it means to people when they come to visit now. And isn't it interesting how the meaning of a place can change over time? I mean, we're talking 100 years. That's a long time. But we see that what has caused this change to happen is events that have happened there. So now not only did we build this place for Lincoln, but we're using it for other purposes. And so um, I don't know if anybody knows this lady, but her name is Marian Anderson. She's a very famous singer in the 1930s, traveled all over the world, and in 1939 wanted to come sing in her nation's capital. And when she tried to book the best concert hall in town for her to perform in, she was told because she was African-American, she couldn't perform there. So they debated about different locations, and eventually they're like, let's have an outdoor concert. That way everybody can come. And they thought about it a little more and they thought, you know, how appropriate would it be for Miss Marion, who's been denied the chance to sing in a building because of her race, to stand on the steps of the memorial that was built to honor, um, you know, the, you've heard the term the great emancipator, whether or not you could debate the, the validity of that title, um, the idea that he was known as someone who um, was you know, someone who had helped to abolish slavery in this country. And so this seemed a very fitting location. And so 75,000 people would come out to see Miss Marion's concert. There they are on the National Mall, all excited. Boy, do you remember when we used to gather in big groups like that? How fun is that? Um, so tons of people came to hear Miss Marion and it didn't matter what you looked like. Everybody was welcome to participate and come join. And a lot of, um, you know, it, it didn't matter your race, everybody could come. And there were a lot more people here than ever would have squished into a concert hall. So this is pretty exciting. Um, the question about Eleanor Roosevelt helping to arrange that. Eleanor Roosevelt was a member of the group that owned the building, the Daughters of the American Revolution. And as a result of um, of this, this situation where they denied her the chance to perform, Eleanor Roosevelt resigned as a member. And that caused a great stir, of course, because she had a newspaper column and she wrote about it in her newspaper column. And what might be the most interesting thing of all is that on the day of the concert, Eleanor Roosevelt chose not to attend because she didn't want the spotlight on her. She wanted the spotlight on Miss Marion. So that's kind of an interesting part of it too. Um, but this concert is going to spark now this idea that we can use the Lincoln Memorial as a stage like this and a place where people gather. And I'm sure you all know who gave probably the most famous speech on these steps. Anybody want to tell me or put it in the chat who uh, who came to Washington and gave a really famous speech. There we Martin go. Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah. Excellent. Very nice. So Dr. King has came to Washington a couple of times. I mean, he came to Washington a lot of times, but he actually gave a few speeches. This one is in 1957. And I don't know if you were listening to, to the news much these days, but they've, I've heard this speech referenced a number of times lately. This is Dr. King in 1957. It was called the Prayer Pilgrimage for Peace, um, uh, the event itself. But the speech he gave came to be known as the Give Them the Ballot speech. And it was, again, he was talking about you know, voting rights for people. And so I just love this photo because there's that microphone right there that Dr. King used to such skill and, you know, promoted, um, promoted his message and used his voice so well. And I just love this picture. You can see the Lincoln in the background, but he's definitely there, you know, giving his speeches. And this was the first time he was there. He would be there on a, a couple of other occasions, but the one y'all know the best, right, is 1963 when he came as part of the March on Washington. And, um, well, I love this photo because he just is so into his speech, you can tell, right? But uh, does anybody see why else I love this picture? Do you see anybody else in this crowd that you might sort of look familiar? Oh, uh, I don't remember his name, but he was a um, flag activist, I think. Do you see anything familiar at all in this picture? That might be particularly why I would like this so much. Go ahead, Edwin. Park Ranger. Exactly. Park yes, Ranger. there are two park rangers in this picture. <laughs> one standing right here and one kneeling down front. And uh, I just love to see that because that's really, you know, 
makes me think that one day I'm going to be standing there when something really big and exciting happens. Not that every day isn't big and exciting and getting to talk to you all is always fun and exciting too. Um, but what a great shot to show the park rangers and Dr. King in this, in this spot. So hey, Ranger, I'm gonna, we have yeah. a, um, we've had a hand up in four corners for a while. Okay. In the back of the room or closer to where our camera is. <laughs> Go ahead, Four Corners. Go ahead. I have a dream that one day my children will grow up and they should not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. Awesome. Excellent. Yeah, yeah he was standing right there when he said those words. That's awesome. So um, I know I'm running short on time. We've got a lot of too many things we want to tell you all about. Um, but real quick, here's what the crowd looked like on the day of the march. Um, 250,000 people came to Washington. The government was a little bit nervous. They were sort of worried that all these people were going to come into town. But it's a very peaceful day. Loads and loads of people bust in, came from all over. And it was hot. It was August of 1963. So apparently there are even people putting their feet in the pool, which is not something we recommend today because the ducks and the geese um, use this as a bathtub. So it's really dirty. You don't want to do that. Um, one of my favorite pictures, though, you know, we see these crowd shots. We see all these people. But to put it on the scale of one particular person who was there and how was and who was affected by being there. I love this picture that you see in the top left corner. This is uh, Miss Edith. And I just want you to look for a second at her face and try and imagine what is she thinking about? She's squished in this crowd. Um, Alex, if you're looking, if you're looking at Lincoln, I believe she's off to the right on the side by the pool, kind of off along the, the, the right side there. And um, Miss Edith is there on her 12th birthday. She came from Detroit, Michigan. I saw, we have some friends from Michigan here today, don't we? Um, yeah, so Miss Edith came from Detroit to visit her aunt who uh, lived in Washington, DC. And she and her mom came to this event because she had heard Dr. King speak before and she wanted to hear him speak again. And she was super excited to go. Her face, every time I look at it, I think, wow, she looks so serious. You know, people have said she looks kind of frightened. She looks kind of sad. Um, it's such an expressive face. And what's so funny is that she did not know that her picture was taken that day. And so her picture was taken and she did not find this picture until she was much, much older. A friend of hers found it in a, um, in a calendar. And um, she then went on to find the photographer of that picture and has become friends with him as well as becoming friends with me. And so um, we used a picture, we used that picture of her in our Martin Luther King Memorial brochure. And so that's how um, she contacted us and said, hey, that's me. And so we've gotten to know her. She comes to Washington. She used to come every year on around her birthday. She liked to be there in August on the anniversary of the March. And here we are at the, at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. So um, Miss Edith has grown up to be someone who was so influenced by being at this march that she became an activist for civil rights. She's given speeches, she's worked ballot boxes, she's helped, she helped count ballots at the last election. Um, so she's very, uh, very civic minded. And that is a result of at 12 years old being at the March on Washington. And so she credits that with being what inspired her to, to go along the career path she chose. And she's, um, she's a wonderful resource to be able to ask about things. So um, here we are at the MLK Memorial. This is the map that shows you now We've changed things up a little, right? We we built the we built you know we had Fords, we built Lincoln, and now we've built the Martin Luther King Memorial to be able to expand upon the stories and to be able to tell more of the stories and be more inclusive and and make sure we include all the different voices. And this has become a really um, a really uh, great addition to us on the National Mall. So we built this Lincoln Memorial to focus on unity and reunion. And it has now become a place where we talk about all sorts of things and we host all kinds of activities. We have um, inaugural events, not the inauguration, but pre-inauguration events. We have presidential visits. We've got uh, 
who's in the top there? Reagan at the top, probably on a birthday. We usually lay a wreath on a birthday. Usually the presidents don't attend, but I guess he chose to attend that year. That's pretty cool. By the way, Saturday, we'll be doing that again with the wreaths because it'll be Lincoln's birthday. Um, for the July fireworks over the National Mall, it's uh, Bruce Springsteen performing. I think it was, uh, I think it was Obama's inaugural pre-inaugural event. We have some presidents, the Trumps, the Obamas. And just this past fall, we had a Ford Theater production come from away right out there performed on the steps at the Lincoln Memorial or the reflecting pool. So this has become a spot that people go to for a lot of different reasons. And so what while it was built with one purpose in mind, maybe it has come to evolve over time. And um, my friend who recited some of the I Have a Dream speech, I sure hope you'll come to Washington someday and put your feet right there because this change was made in 2003 to put the words I Have a Dream on the spot where Dr. King was standing. So you can come put your feet right there and you're standing in the spot where he was standing when he gave his speech. So this building has changed a bit over the years. What it means has changed a bit over the years, um, but it certainly has come to be an important part of the landscape in Washington, DC. And so when you uh, are thinking about a hundred year celebration, please uh, you know, feel free to, to, to contact us about uh, ideas you have for that. All right, and with moments to spare. <laughs> Sorry. No, I mean, we have so many awesome stories and we're excited to share them with you. Um, so if you have any questions, I saw, uh, I saw some questions going back to the Lincoln family. Um, we answered that Robert Lincoln passed away a few years after the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, and then his children did not have children or, or something like that. And so, uh, so there are no direct descendants of the Lincolns alive today. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us. Any questions? Yeah, Are you guys excited to come visit Washington now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hands up. I see thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you all for your participation. It was great having you. Oh, here's one. How do we find out if there are events happening before we visit? Bye, Edgewood. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. So, uh, so with, I mean, so with Ford's Theater, you just go to our website and you can find out everything that's happening at Ford's Theater. Um, and if you want to know more about like what's happening in the city, like you want to know if there's going to be a lot of other people in town, either because there's a rally or a protest or because it's cherry blossom season and that's a big tourist attraction for us. I think the best thing is just to keep an eye on the news. Um, is we there- recommend the Washington a, Post, yeah. Yeah, because they or usually- there's, there's Destination DC. There are websites that deal with that kind of thing, yeah. All right, well, if there are no other questions, I just want to thank everybody for um, attending and thank you so much to our presenters. We so appreciate all your time. Can I, can I respond to one more thing? Yeah, of Centennial course. events. Um, we do have a website that just started. Um, it just was launched last week and it's, it's nps.gov slash link L-I-N-C, which is our Lincoln Memorial website. And you'll see a big logo for the Centennial and you can click on there and there's a calendar this program was supposed to end up on that calendar, but uh, I'm not sure it made it, but uh, we'll start populating that calendar um, very soon. So we're starting to put our events on that page. So nps.gov slash link. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs>